28th, 2018 meeting of the Santa Cruz Mel Metropolitan Transit District to order. We're in the Santa Cruz City Council Chamber. We, we appreciate their hosting us here today. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Here. 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 Director Thank you. Um, we will um, have some announcements with Car uh, Carlos Landavera uh, to announce his Spanish language interpretation. If you would please just uh, let the public know in Spanish. Pleasure. Good morning. Buenos dias, directors. Carlos Landaverri, your interpreter. Para las personas que prefieren español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. And I want to mention that today's meeting is being broadcast by uh, Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Uh, first of all, uh, no, item number four, any comments from directors? Comments, uh, director? Yes, uh, Ms. Matthews. Um, I'll just mention that um, John Leopold and I, were there any others? We were at a press conference yesterday on the No on Six campaign. Oh, good. Yeah. I can, that was well attended by all the press. And where was it? Uh, it, 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 it happened over in Live Oak uh, by the Sheriff's Center. Uh, the speakers included uh, the two of us, uh, Supervisor uh, Friend. Um, uh, Jim Hart. Uh, Jim, Sheriff Jim Hart. Uh, um, Cody Muley, uh, representing the Firefighters Association. Cesar Lara. Uh, from the Labor, Labor. Council. Labor. Um, it was somebody were, from um, the uh, engineers. Um, OE3, maybe construction um, labor. I know that there are many in the healthcare community. Did you mention, I don't know if you mentioned that they're concerned, you know, about access to mm -hmm. medical care yeah. if uh, we don't have the right transportation network to get people in need. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the sheriff made sense, uh, made it clear that having uh, money for uh, road repair is actually a public safety issue. Yes. Okay. And uh, I thought it came across very well and, you know, the uh, right now, we're, we, we should be uh, feel good that the last poll said 52% no, 39% yes, uh, and so that's the right direction, but there's a lot more work to do. Right. Uh, we cannot give up, and people should vote no on Prop 6. The, uh, I've been, personally, and I think many of you have, been going to um, uh, various meetings of uh, community groups and just informing them of that uh, that situation. It, it would mean about almost two and a half million dollar loss for this transit district to begin with. And then it just, I think for the whole county, it's, it gets into double that at least and more. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, 15. Yeah, 15 million something, yeah, triple probably. Um, I will mention also um, Deanna Sessoms from League of California Cities was the coordinator with the statewide campaign people. Um, and we will have yard signs, um, I think maybe even today for Santa Cruz County. So um, I will, from my own personal email, let people know where to get those. Right, and um, <laughs> the California State Association of Counties, which I'm a member, uh, is, has also come out strongly opposed to that and was a strong supporter of Senate Bill 1 in the first place. So, Any other comments from members? Well, thank you for mm -hmm. doing the press conference. <laughs> Yeah, this, it's, it's such a tragedy for this district. If, if, if Prop Six passes, it would be we would be hurting badly. We'd be cutting routes again. I mean, that's the reality here. And jobs. Okay, we will move now to oral communications. Uh, we've heard any any other different comments on a different subject from the board members. Uh, comments from the public. Any comments from the public on items that are not on the agenda? Seeing none. Um, we have any written communications from the MAC? No? Okay. Um, labor organization communications. Any comments from labor? Uh, should come up? All right, moving right along. Wake up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't wake up. No. <laughs> uh, I want to mention that Director Rothwell is just. Uh, can we do something uh, about traffic? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Different commission. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we will have um, some, uh, we'll go to the, um, 
the consent agenda. Um, it might be. Um, is there are there any uh, any questions on the consent agenda? It might be that um, I think 9.8 we might cover in the CEO report because I think there are some uh, issues about some one-time reserve money and so forth uh, that I think should be clarified or explained further. So I'm going to uh, couple 9.8 uh, with the CEO oral report. So 12.1. Any other member who would like to pull an item? I didn't note this new material on 9-5, uh, too. That's my grant. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you for that explanation. Okay, um, I'll have a, any, a motion to motion to approve the consent. Unless anybody in the public has a comment. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yes. Anybody in the com uh, the public have a comment on the consent agenda? Move approval of the consent agenda. I'll second it. Move and second it. All those as amended to have 9.8 become 12.1. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Now we have uh, the good times uh, here. We, the presentation of Employee Longevity Awards for Brian Lamb, facilities maintenance worker for 10 years. Is Brian here? Nope. Okay. Um, Dan Stevenson, bus operator for 20 years. On up. All right, please. All right. Thanks. Uh, Vice Chair Bottorf will present you with a certificate. like to thank you for, uh, let's see, let me see, that's 20 years of service as a bus operator. Thank you very much. Is would uh, like to have you make, if you wish, uh, make a few comments. Well, I uh, just really appreciate this. This uh, is going to be a great reminder for me. I'm going to put it on my wall uh, <laughs> in my room to remind me to, uh, to put in my dentures, uh, grab my toupee <laughs> and cane, and uh, take my Viagra. So there you go. Uh, oh now, uh, I, uh, I'm not as old as some of the people getting the longevity award today, but I'm I'm sure I uh, I don't look as good as, as as some of these guys that have been around for 30 years like Angel. I mean, if I can be uh, looking that good at that point and not have to come in here with my walker, that'd be great. But I don't think I'm gonna last 30 years. But thank you for this. Thank you for your great <laughs> service for 20 years. Thank you. Angel J. Valdez, um, bus operator, 30 years. <coughs> Excuse me, is Angel here? No, he's not here. Oh, he's tired. You okay? He's tired, <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, now we have a um, presentation of re uh, employee retirement awards. Um, and they're not here either. I would like to just mention then, it's Leticia Kalajas. Callejas. 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 18 years. Ellen Peterson, benefits administrator for 14 years. Um, that's a long period of service uh, for our employees, and we really appreciate. They've had a lot to deal with in these last few years, as we all know, and we really appreciate their efforts throughout the year. So thank you to them. I'll move the uh, resolutions that uh, 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 recognize their service Retire to the district. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Now we'll, we'll go to the um, CEO's oral report. Alex Clifford, our general manager. Mr. Chair, uh, directors, yes, uh, several items I'd like to cover with you today. Um, in front of you, you have a copy of uh, uh, a letter. Actually, these are comments that are being made on my behalf to the California Air Resources Board today in their public hearing on the new regulation that they're proposing. We've talked about that over the last uh, nearly a year, and I've given you regular reports on that. So the comments generally reflect the same kinds of topics that we had concerns about. Um, we also had coverage this week on KSBW. They interviewed me and they interviewed Carl Sidoric, CEO of Monterey Salinas Transit, MST, south of us. Um, unfortunately, their, their headline sort of makes it sound like MST and Metro are against 
the regulation, which is not true, and we were very clear with them that it's not about the regulation, we're not against the regulation. There are components of the regulation that we're working hard to change um, because we're dealing with public funds here and we need to make sure that this regulation is, uh, recognizes that this technology is not perfected. And unfortunately today, the California Air Resources Board staff and the environmentalists that are, that are advocates for the staff version of this um, believe that this technology has been perfected at transit properties like Foothill Transit down south and uh, San Joaquin <coughs> Transit. Um, and they think that it's ready to launch full scale, and it's not. Um, in particular, the range of these buses are about 120 to 150 miles. Um, we need to be able to charge a bus all night, put it out on runs that are out there for as many as 300 miles. And so what that tells you is it's going to take some time for battery energy technology to continue to evolve, and it's evolving, but it's going to take some time for it to get to the place where we need it to be. And then there's another term that we've coined, which is end of life. So batteries that can do a certain range when they are delivered new at end of life, you know, as you approach 12 years of life of a bus, um, have what we call battery degradation, so they have less range in them. And so the term we use is we need 300 miles end of life. Um, so our caution to the California Air Resources Board is um, slow down on the front end of this. Um, we, we have no issues with being fully zero emission by 2040. As you know, you've taken a position, actually you took a position um, in May of 2017, nearly seven months in advance of the draft um, regulation. You took a position saying that you wanted to be, um, set a goal of being fully electric by 2040. Um, as a matter of fact, in 2016, again, at least a year, year and a half in advance of that regulation, you allowed us to apply for grants. We received a low no grant from the federal government to buy three electric over the road coaches. And then in the year that followed, we received a number of grants that we cobbled together to purchase four electric Proterra buses. We're still working on the specification of that. Um, and that's getting close. But this agency has shown the governor and the California Air Resources Board that it is interested, it is on board with electric buses, but we need to take it a little slow in the beginning. Um, what our goal is, per, per one of your previous actions also, is that we want to get our four buses and then our other three for a total of seven here so that we can learn about it. Um, they're not going to do 300 miles. They're going to have to be programmed on routes of 150 miles or less, but we have a lot of learning to do. We have, our bus operators have to learn how to use electric buses because depending on how heavy footed you are, you can use up the energy quicker uh, and our mechanics have to be trained on how to maintain a whole different propulsion technology. Um, and we have to build the electric infrastructure. So there's a lot for us to learn. We're a small property, we're dealing with the public funds, uh, and we just don't want to make a mistake where we buy equipment that we're stuck with for 12, 14 or more years, uh, and it just won't do the job for us. So that's really where the focus of it is. Um, we've also told CARB uh, numerous times that the uh, heavy vehicle incentive program, HVIP, which provides up to $165,000 to offset the difference in costs between conventional technology and electric technology, we've said that you need to be, you need to make that money available all the way through the program, not just for what they call early adopters. And they're trying to go in a direction that if you wait to buy buses in the year in which the mandate requires you to do it, you don't get the incentive. Well, that's just shooting yourself in the foot. And so we've been very clear about that. Those comments are being made on our behalf today. Uh, and some other points that are in there. You can read that, but they're consistent with our previous position. I'll know more later today about what kind of comments were made. The regulation now probably won't be finalized until January. They've now moved it out to January. Is there anything that we could do to uh, explain our caution? I mean, we're at the front of the line in this. and. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that would help and, and maybe do it in, in conjunction with Monterey or, well, I think we may probably should do it separately. We're, we've already made our statement that uh, we want to do this, but we want to be ready and do it correctly. Uh, we, we have, and, and you've had me at the table in Sacramento, and if not actually physically there on the, on the conference calls for many months with Jack Katowski and his staff. Um, 
and, and in partnership with the CTA, the California Transit Association, um, really participating in, in a statewide effort to try to get these same themes incorporated into their program. Um, their, the CARB staff sort of pats themselves on the back as saying this process worked, we made some changes to the regulation and we're ready to move on. Our position really is, you know, what's worked is you've made some changes to some small parts of this, but there's some big parts that they haven't moved on that still need to be fixed and that's, that's where our position has been. Okay, Director, I'd like to mention that uh, Director Hagan is here. Um, Director Rockin. Can you, can you give us some idea of how they respond when you tell them about our actual real-world experience with these buses? I mean, they're, they're, they're dealing with an abstract theory about, you know, yeah. a goal we all would love to share, but I mean, it, it's a, so when you tell them, we, t we got these buses, we did this, this is what happened, what did the staff of the Air Board say back to you? Well, I, I have had that conversation with them. Uh, in, in early meetings, I was very sort of uh, direct about asking if any of the CARB staff had ever worked at a transit property, ever, you know, had to make a budget, dealt with public funds running tr public transit, and the answer was no. They couldn't identify anybody associated with this process of developing this regulation who had real world experience. And, and that's really where I was going with the point is you should trust these many, many properties across the state who have to run a service, a heavily subsidized service, and that if we make mistakes, those dollars that we waste because mistakes are made in this electric integration will impact our customers in the way of not being able to buy new equipment on schedule and having to, to re make budget reductions which impact the poorest of the poor, the transit dependent. And we've tried to make that point over and over. I even close in this letter making that point again. You know, be careful what you impose upon us in this unfunded mandate. I don't doubt that you made the case as well as it could be made. That's not my, my, the point of my comment. I, I, is it just that they're getting such a sense that the goal is so important that if, if they just press hard enough, somebody somewhere will respond like, we won't buy the bus and then the bus companies will make their batteries better faster because of their pressure? Or, you, I, maybe you don't know the answer to this question, but what, what, what drives uh, ignoring obvious evidence that there's an issue that they need to address. Yeah. Uh, well, this comes down from the governor. This has been the governor's goal. And so CARB is really doing what the governor would like to have done, fulfilling his mission of being, you know, fully electric by, by 2040. Um, you, you just made an excellent point, which, which, you know, I've said to them time and time again, we need to be careful to force the original equipment manufacturers, the Proteros, the BYDs, and, and others, to continue to be incentivized to innovate, to spend the R&D money to improve battery energy technology, thereby improving range. When you hand them through this regulation on a gold platter, thousands of buses that must mandatorily be purchased in the coming years, what incentive do they have to continue to innovate? And that's a real concern. So it's not an easy question to answer. You know, what, no. what are they thinking? Yeah. No. Any, other, <coughs> any other questions from the board? You have any? Uh, yes. So moving on. Uh, so uh, we've sent you, and we'll send you again, information about the uh, transit board members' government workshop, governance workshop in Washington D.C. APTA really screwed this up. They know they have. This is sort of one and done, and they'll figure it out different next year. But for now, it's happening right the week after Thanksgiving. It's a really terrible time. But if uh, I think Mr. Dutra has indicated he would like to go, and if others would like to go, please let me know. It is a good opportunity. They're, they're, they're trying something new where the CEOs and the board members are there at the same time. There'll be sessions when we're together and sessions when we're not. And then there'll be some opportunity to do some lobbying on the Hill if anybody's there the week after Thanksgiving. Um, but it, it should be a, a decent session. I'm going to go, and uh, if you'd like to go, let me know. That's the Monday. We would fly out the Monday after Thanksgiving, and I think that's the 26th. We would be in sessions Tuesday, Wednesday. You would fly home Thursday. I have to stay for another meeting on Friday and then fly home Friday. Uh, so let me know. We'll send that out again. It's a really good opportunity for people to get ideas, too, to bring back. So Yeah, it really is. Mr. Leopold, I wish I would have known. I, I bought tickets last week that I'm oh, returning from the East Coast on 
Monday after Thanksgiving. Oh. Um, I don't know whether I can change it, but it's, it, it, it might be interesting to think second pull that off. Yeah, maybe we can work we something out. I think we have CSAC, though, the week after Thanksgiving. Yes, right, in Monterey. Yeah. Okay, you know, maybe we can work something out. Um, and, and Gina's going to go um, because they're going to really have a focus on uh, software that you can use for your board package. I know some cities like Watsonville and I think even the county are using new software packages. We still do it the old-fashioned way. So we need to look at some of those, those concepts. She's going to investigate that as a part of this. Um, next, going on to 908, uh, Mr. Chair, you asked that that be combined with our, my comments. 908, uh, I mistakenly put that on consent calendar. It has a really good part of it that we sort of need to celebrate. Part of it is to close out last year through, you know, last fiscal year through June and to show you what the outcome was. But a part of that closeout is that we had over $3 million in carryover. That not only did we manage the business well, um, unfortunately we had a lot of vacancies that helped contribute to that. We, we, we don't ever want to bank on vacancies. But if you go to page uh, 908, pages 10 and 11, um, I can just point you to the good news. So 908, pages 10 and 11. And what you'll see on 908.10 is a chart that shows the uh, carryover from last year of $3.951 million. Um, and the really good news is last year you directed us, when we closed out the budget, you said, gee, we have this deficiency across the various reserves pots, um, cash, uh, uh, cash flow reserves, workers' comp, liability, um, and, and then your two months of operating expense reserve pot. And you said to staff, you said, come back and tell us how we're going to fill those pots, because that's important to have appropriate reserves. We came back and we gave you a five-year plan on how we were going to do that. And the good news is, because of this one year of carryover, we were able to fill all those pots in the one year. So your, your Unless you direct us to do something different, your, your reserve pots are now all full to 100% of board authorized levels, and we have $640,000 that we can put into the uh, capital program to take care of capital needs, maybe use it as a local match for a grant. Um, so really good news, and I, I uh, regret putting that on the consent calendar, so I wanted to oh, that's point right. out I, I that think uh, things went really, really well. Uh, it's some, with great needs uh, everywhere, it's sometimes difficult to say why we need these reserves. It's for emergencies or matching uh, grants of some type or another. Um, it's critical that we build that up as we have, I should say, in the county government as well, and I think if the cities could say the same, but uh, it's really critical. Uh, Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate that you uh, brought this uh, to the public's attention because um, it was not that long ago that we sat at these very same seats uh, wondering over a, an eight-month process or a six-month process looking uh, at our financial situation and looking at a lot of negative numbers in these, uh, the buckets that, you know, I remember the, the, uh, um, the, the screenshot of all the buckets and they look pretty low. Uh, I, I remember that. And because of uh, work by our staff, um, uh, support from the public, both through the uh, Cabrillo vote by the UCSC, by the passage of Measure D and the passage of SB1, those pieces combined have allowed us to be in this place where we're able to uh, fill these buckets and, and continue to move forward um, in, uh, in strengthening the financial foundation of Metro. So it's a real credit to uh, the staff and everybody involved in terms of, uh, of, of watching their cost. It's a, it's a credit to the public as well. And um, we should herald this uh, because uh, it, uh, just a few years ago, it seemed insurmountable. Uh, it, was, it was a huge challenge. So uh, this is a great day to celebrate. I might just add, too, that um, if Prop 6 passes, this could change very quickly, too. Uh, so this is another one of those examples of how important it is to us. the most recent poll? Uh -huh. yeah, he, yeah. he mentioned uh, 5239. in the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other comments? Um, and, and I, go ahead. With this item, I do want to acknowledge our finance team. Um, 
Debbie and Angela, and of course the team that works for them, they have been vigilant in keeping this on the front burner. I mean, this is a big issue for stability of our foundation, our financial foundation. So, credit to, where credit is due, our finance team is fabulous. Chris, um, moving on to uh, just uh, we, oh, oh yeah, that's right. We need a motion on the 908 if we we can. Uh, so moved. I'll second the motion. Second. <laughs> I didn't catch your move. It's me. Leopold. Uh, excuse, do we, we, we have we need, a whole lot of seconds. Any seconds? <laughs> take a pick. Who wants yeah. to take that? Well, there's. I don't know. I don't know if we should. We should probably get if the motion. We should. Any comments from the public? Okay. We'll move it back to the board for the call for uh, the vote. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay. Moving on, I, I do not have any uh, promotions or new hires to announce other than we do have a new bus operator class starting on the 9th. That's set, uh, six fixed route operators. Um, the challenge is that we need more. We're just not getting enough qualified applications. We're getting a decent pool of applicants, but they're just not, when narrowed down, they're just not qualified. And then once you get through the interview process, we, we had six. <clears throat> we need more than that uh, because of retirees, uh, vacancies. And we're going to make another push so that we can do another class on the heels of this class. Um, it's unfortunate, but we're trying hard. It's just been very difficult to recruit for positions. And it's not just there. We're having a tough time recruiting for custodians, a uh, difficult time recruiting for vehicle service workers. Um, so we're, we're trying. HR is just, not it, it, it's mind-boggling. And, and HR is trying everything they can. They're, they're trying innovative approaches creative approaches, even posting uh, job specs in laundromats. I mean, we're trying different ways to get to people to let them know that we have vacancies. And then we made a full court press at the, the fair recently, uh, letting people know that we had vacancies and, and encouraging them to fill out applications. Good, good effort. Yes. Um, oh, uh, Director Kaufman Gomez. I'm sorry, can I ask on that effort, are you doing the Cabrillo College? Or are you doing anything with the vocational, you know, the Watsonville Adult, uh, Watsonville Santa Cruz County Adult Ed? Um, are we doing any outreach on that part where they're, you know, getting their basic skills together? Maybe there will be some that get out of the basic skills that would have an interest in some of these openings? Well, we do the job fairs. And I don't know if we're doing, Don, do you know if we're doing anything with Cabrillo? Yeah, the Watsonville adult, adult Care and, uh, no, the Watsonville Santa Cruz Adult Education. So that would be Dr. Bilicic is the director for that program and may have some resources there. And the, the CET, there's a few other programs along that line that um, should be investigated because those are some of them getting their skills together and maybe they would fit some of the, the job criteria or get trained so that they can meet some of the job criteria. In, any advice any of the directors have, please let us know because we want to try everything. And we're, we are also focusing on the veteran angle too. Director Chase? I was just going to add to that the County Office of Education operates the formerly known as Regional Occupational Program, now known as Career Technical Education. And so that's county wide. And they probably have folks that they could send your way or do the same type of thing of training for specific skills. Good. Appreciate that advice. And, and just, you know, not that this is consoling, but uh, in discussing this with colleagues at the recent uh, APTA conference last week, uh, it is a topic talked about nationwide, transit properties across the nation, um, in healthy cities, in not so healthy cities, are all struggling trying to recruit. So it's a, it's a challenge. Director like Matthews. Uh, yeah. Um, RPD uh, does a hiring bonus for referrals. Um, employees who refer someone who then is hired and stays is two parts. I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought of that, too. No, we'll, if it's that critical. We'll uh, chat about that, too. We'll add that to the list. We'll you talk, we'll talk to about H anything you can help us yeah, with. Talk to the HR people. It's been helpful. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, moving on to bus and bus facilities grant. You might recall last year, we received an award of about $2 million uh, in the bus and bus facilities grant program. And uh, the next round, of course, we apply every year. We did not get a, rant, uh, a grant this year. It was just announced this week who received grants. Um, and California actually did a little better. I'm changing my perspective. I thought the president was out to get California last year. 
Um, but this year he was actually fairly generous to California, so I, I take back all those bad things I said. <laughs> it's because he said them. <laughs> hey, maybe, yeah. maybe he Don't wasn't take paying back. attention. Don't take them back. I strayed into politics, didn't I? Right. <laughs> Comments yeah. are appreciated. They took so, it um, <laughs> moving right along. Moving along. So I did. I did have the opportunity to to query the acting uh, FTA administrator in Nashville about this topic because the FTA has been sending mixed messages. The message uh, a couple of years ago was that they want everything scalable. And scalable meant that if you need, in our case, 60 buses, <clears throat> don't ask for 60 buses in one year. Tell us how you can scale it over multiple years and bring in the local match and get, get the job done. And that's been our approach and we've had pretty good success. But their model in the last year or so has changed now. So now scalable for them means on an annual basis when you submit a grant, tell us, if you're going to submit for 10, tell us what's the minimum that you'll, you'll, you're willing to receive. Well, that's a little akin to negotiating against yourself, right? You know, I walk onto a car lot, I want to buy a $15,000 car, I offer you 10, but then in the next sentence I say, but I'll pay you 13. That's, that's what they're asking us to do, is to negotiate against ourselves. Um, you know, we'll take anything we can get. Um, but the reality is, why, why ask for eight when they're, they're probably going to give us the low end? And that's what they did last year. Um, the other thing the, I queried the administrator on is, is um, the mixed message that, that's not in the statute, but the mixed message the FTA has been saying about if you receive a grant one year, you won't get it the next year. And so we, and really entire APTA, have been concerned about this because we've heard that that's what they're doing. And she was very direct. She said, look, here's how it works. If you got a LONO grant last year, you're not going to get a LONO grant or a bus and bus facilities grant this year. If you got a bus and bus facilities grant last year, you may not get one this year if the program is oversubscribed. Well, guess what? The program is always oversubscribed by at least tenfold. And so even though we wrote a really fabulous grant with an even larger overmatch, local overmatch, than we did in prior years, we went up to, I think, 60 or 70 percent local match this time. It should have been one that they would salivate over. But because it's oversubscribed, we got one last year. We didn't get one this year. So we'll try again next year. I have a question. Um, have we had any um, luck with kind of converting the grant that we have for the over the the, um, the Santa Cruz route to different buses. How's that conversation going? Yeah, so that went really well. <clears throat> so board members uh, that joined us uh, last year uh, talked to the FTA about that. We came back, we negotiated with Region 9 local FTA. We have a verbal agreement. We're waiting on that happening in writing. But we have a verbal agreement that they will go with our plan, which is we get to keep the money. They restrict our drawdown on the money. They'll only let us use a portion of it to build the electric charging infrastructure at our bus yard. The rest of it for the purchase of buses, they'll let us keep on hold until more manufacturers jump into the market. So we think within two years, BYD, not, I'm sorry, BYD's already there, MCI and Van Hool are gonna produce zero emission over the road coaches, at which time the FTA said they'll allow us to go out for bid and we'll try again. So basically, um, we can't get the CNG buses. We 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 only can do the correct. So they're they're letting us put the money on hold rather than transfer it over to a different type of bus. Correct. They liked our Plan B and not our Plan A. Okay, they didn't like our Plan A. Okay, that's, <laughs> I, I was hearing Plan B right now. I was like, well, what happened to Plan A? That's so, exactly it. So putting it. Yeah. On. So I, I'll I'll feel more comfortable when I see that in writing. But that's what they have given us verbally. Okay. Um, the most important thing is, three point eight million dollars, at, at this point, is still ours. So I'll keep you informed when I get that in writing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and then last, uh, at your diocese, you have kind of a neat little article that Transit Talent did, which is cool. So always nice to get a little bit of recognition. All right. Thank you. That concludes my remarks. Other questions from the board? Okay. We will move to item number 13, which we have discussed briefly, uh, an update on educating the public about the benefits of Senate Bill 1. With the tragedy of uh, Proposition 6, I don't know how you want to put this, but um, Barrow Emerson is unable to uh, uh, be here today because of a family situation. Um, do, would you like to report on that? 
Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, directors, this is just an opportunity we, we, that we are placing on your agenda uh, for yet another month after this, before the November election, for you to educate the public on what the consequences are if Proposition 6 passes. And as we've talked about before, uh, and as the chair just indicated, it's it's $2.4 million minimum to us. There would be other competitive money, which would probably likely take it well over $3 million um, that will be lost if, if Proposition passes. What What is that money used for today? Well, that money helps you c commit $3 million a year to our capital program so that we can match state and federal grants and start attacking aggressively our backlog to replace 62 buses. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, it also is used to support the existing services we have out there. So if it were to pass, um, you'll have to make some tough decisions about the capital program and the service we provide on the street. Uh, and I think as, as uh, Director Dutra mentioned earlier, the service reductions can lead to, uh, unfortunately, layoffs, and that's not a good thing. So this is important to us. It will impact, if it passes, it will impact the transit dependent, the poorest of the poor. Um, this is a program that really helps us to provide the service that we provide, including replacing buses that we desperately need to replace so that our service is dependable and we do what we need to do to get people to work, to, to their doctor's appointments and other types of uh, personal events. Questions from the board? Director Rockin. I guess I didn't want it to, to pass without some notice that you talked about us making a 70% match on our um, in order to get federal grants. You know, for the whole history of this district, and I've been here for a lot of it, we got, you know, basically we put 20% in and got 80% from the federal government. And I don't want to blame this one on the president, actually. I think this is a question for Congress to let this stuff slide to the point so you're 10 times oversubscribed in the applications and you're forced to, instead of putting the bid in, which everybody did in the whole country, there was very little overmatching. I think we we're one of the first districts to even try overmatching. And everybody, get basically, the federal government paid for 80% of the capital cost. They got out of the operation. They used to be in operations uh, funding that. They got out of that. It was just going to be capital. And mainly for us, that's buses, other things as well, but mainly mainly buses. And they, they funded 80% of the cost of a new bus. And now they, they turned down an application to fund 30% uh, of a, a new bus. So the cost to the local public who are paying taxes and so forth to support the public transit system really means the federal government's walking away from the support of transit almost completely. And Congress has to get the message somehow that this really matters to people in the United States, that I mean, public transit's a key in, uh, institution for even um, suburban areas. I mean, it used to be an urban issue only for, for bus systems, but suburban areas, small communities like Santa Cruz, uh, and so that's, that's really tragic that they're sort of walking away from this, and we just have to increase the pressure on people in Congress to take this much more seriously. That, that just represents a loss of millions and millions of dollars to us. I mean, I started getting nervous. What if they give us all our grants at 30, you know, where, where they're only giving us 30 percent of the cost of a bus? What, how will that affect in the long run our notion that $3 million a year will get us out of this problem, at least eventually? That starts to look questionable, too. When, what, what happens when people overmatch us? If everybody says they'll pay 70% of the cost of a bus, somebody's going to offer 75 to, in order to get, eventually be getting $10 on a bus from the feds. It, it's just ridiculous. Well, that's, that's true. And, and our, one of our concerns is that the, the large monster properties, you know, the Golden Gate, San Francisco, Muni's, LAMTA, um, have those kinds of resources. I mean, look at LAMTA. They have uh, three or four sales tax initiatives, and they're building, building, building. They have those kinds of resources that we don't have. I, I would just offer, Mike, that um, you know our next trip is just around the corner to D.C., right, early uh, next year, April-ish, probably. Uh, it's time to talk about reauthorization already, yeah. and I think that's where we will focus is uh, that it needs to not only be plussed up as it has been last year and maybe this year, but they need to work from the new plus up foundation to add additional dollars in the program. Now, hand in hand with that, we're, we're nearing uh, a potential interesting controversy with the existing authorization because even though it was fairly decent, the last year to year and a half, of year to year and a half of it was not 
uh, funded. They did not identify funding sources. So it's going to be an interesting year coming up to do that and at the same time talk about reauthorization. They told us to come back and ask next year. Well, we will. <laughs> Direct yeah, um, I think we slid into 14 maybe, but back on uh, the Prop 6. Um, one of the uh, calls at the press conference yesterday was for individual agencies to get letters to the editor and so forth. So I think it would be appropriate if someone from representing Metro put in a letter to the editor. I don't know, Mike or Bruce, if you want, anyone wants to take that on. Maybe it would be good if we... Uh, had representatives from uh, each end of the county or something to sign that or something like it. that. Yeah, yeah I think it that could would, be a, we could a say major op-ed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to we'll take that one on? I'll, I'll take that on. I'll yeah. take responsibility for that. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I would also point out, I think at your diocese, you have a copy of the, uh, the recent headways. Um, <clears throat> and we cleared this through legal so that we were educating the public about the consequences of Prop 6. But this was our, our last effort before the election to really help people understand what it does for us. And we did reference the impact on Metro at the press conference, too. I don't know if you saw the comments. But did. Thank you. Yeah. Any comments? Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public on any of this? Shoe? Okay, I will. Uh, oh, excuse me. coming up. Oh, excuse me. So, sorry, Eduardo. I never want to miss you, your, your <laughs> comments. So, thank you. Good morning, Board of Directors, Eduardo Montesino. You know, um, we're doing great efforts, but I think we need to do more as a metro because, you know, we were at the uh, fair and we're driving these buses and we have a little sticker that nobody could see. And, you know, it's cognizant of, uh, on us, even in education, that we can probably blow that up. Um, everybody's doing it um, because having a, a little small sticker, you can't see it. We're the sticker is the one that says SB1. is purchased Just, with SB1 yeah, yeah. funds, yeah. yeah. So thank you. Oh, and yes, while you're there, um, I know you, you, you and all the other um, uh, bargaining units have a very active communication network with your members. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you can push out the no on six, Oh yeah, Message. that's uh, we're doing it. We're yeah. doing it wholeheartedly, not just uh, to our members, but also to the family members and yeah, you know, everybody. Goes on. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Okay, we'll move on to um, <clears throat> item number fourteen. Somewhat. We'll go ahead, uh, All right. Mr. Chair. Do you want to? Uh, or Barrow's not here. Uh, Cyril, are you? Yeah. Uh, Cyril's Cyril. not here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I me. guess I put that <laughs> fast meeting. <laughs> Uh, Just note that there's a color in the packet of stuff on the table. There's a color version of the table yeah. that goes with this item. You might find easier to read. Good morning, Mr. Chair, directors. Um, I'm here to try to explain <coughs> a little bit about what's going on with this particular long-range bus replacement plan. And um, essentially, at the request of the uh, CEO, uh, staff engaged, in a year-long development of this particular piece of uh, staff report. Uh, it consists of a lot more information, but uh, I'll give you the overview of it, uh, and it's based on addressing our aging fleet. Uh, it's been referred to as the 62 bus replacement plan. So um, the team basically consisted of about six individuals. Um, it was uh, Ms. Erin Alvey, our purchasing agent, uh, uh, Barrow Emerson, planning, uh, Eddie Benson, our fleet manager, uh, Freddie Rocha, our assistant maintenance manager, Antonio Castillo, maintenance supervisor. Uh, we were all engaged in this whole process. So what we have before you basically is, um, is a strategic approach toward achieving a reduction in the number of age buses in Metro's fleet. Um, the strategy overall includes new bus and slightly used bus purchases, uh, lease to purchase programs, uh, existing fleet bus refurbishing, which will extend the life of the buses. Um, hopefully by year 2022, it's anticipated that the approach will result in a balance of older and newer buses. Excuse me, I don't know, if, can we put this up on the screen? Or is it, is it? it could be. Um, Somewhat un understandable, but I think the, it will kind of tell us how we're going to go about it. Thank you.
approved. You seek to our ears. Watch what you ask for. Storm. <laughs> <laughs> Fourteen A one. Fourteen A one. This will mention uh, the replacement needs, decommissions, refurbishment, bus replacements, lease uh, buses, uh, replacement and refurb refurbishments due. Here's, now, the see. Here's the chart. Now we can flip it. Yeah. Now you're getting tricky. Yeah, I know. Um, stand on the side. Just read it as a vertical chart rather than a horizontal. <laughs> no, seriously, you can read it. Not the numbers, you get the bars. You have the numbers here. You can read those. <clears throat> Everybody in the audience could lay down. And look yeah. yeah. <laughs> They seem like a great four, but they all have a <laughs> neck problem. <laughs> Are we? Um, Here you go. See that little? Yeah. yeah. No, you go back where you were. You had a. But it, it was back one. No, that wasn't it. Oh. Yeah. On one where you, where you had a mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, have one we do have <laughs> one actually. Oh, we got Isaac. We have one of the uh, okay. Fair. Look at oh, that. No, it's <coughs> you can do it. Yeah. We have one at the board. We're getting there. Are you? We're all getting a lesson in PDFs today. Yeah, right. There it is. There we go. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Give that man a raise. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. that, I don't know. I, probably uh, <laughs> sure if it <laughs> might you help it. The light yellow, <laughs> gold, and blue. Pink. We should have called a four. Pink, yellow, gold, and blue. We could do ref just refer to those colors. Sure. Yeah. Show up here. So, <clears throat> as you can see on the chart now, um, <laughs> <laughs> <expectations>. <laughs> the um, the upper. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Upper uh, row, or basically indicates the number of buses that uh, that is in. The Can field. you work on the mic, please? Excuse me. Thank you. No. So we refer to the upper row in the pink. Basically, it gives you the number of buses that are scheduled on, for replacement. So we're starting in fiscal year 17 and 18 with 62. We've had some uh, refurbishes <laughs> and we've had some new buses come in, so it's dropped in down to 57. Okay. <clears throat> Each of the, um, the rows following will have a, a reference to decommissions, and you'll see that uh, the 57 right below it shows a minus four. Those are the number of buses that were uh, uh, taken out of service, dropping, dropping that number down. Um, <clears throat> refurbishments, uh, you'll see that there were in fiscal year 18, five and another in 19, two. That's what our projection is. Are, are the refurbishments, are the refurbishments done by our in-house uh, in staff or our own mechanics? It's a mixture. Yes. There's, there's, um, um, engine overhauls and things of that nature. We usually send out because we get a warranty with the engine, but we do do, uh, in in-house rebuilds right for for repair purposes that gives us a little leg up when when the bus is down uh bus replacements we're looking at uh perhaps three that's coming in in fiscal year 19 and uh as as you go along the column or the the row you'll see it increases decreases increases the number of buses that we 
uh, are hoping and planning to purchase or, and or uh, replace. So bus leases, again, uh, we're looking at fiscal year 21 before we start doing another six. Replacement of refurbishments due. So basically by year, fiscal year 24, there's five that need to be added to that for, re, for refurbishing. Additional buses become obsolete. That's the yellow. You'll see five in 23, 11 in 24, just fluctuates as such. So then buses bought since 2018 becoming obsolete. You'll see that that stretches out over into fiscal year 30. That's when we start having like three of them that need to be replaced and things like that. Those are the buses because of what we bought the years out. That's how it begins to translate. So end of the fiscal year bus replacement needs, basically, you'll see where, where we started with 62, and, then it, and that's the blue line. It drops down in fiscal year 22 and 23 to zero. That means that we've caught up with everything. We've got our refurbishments in place. We've got our, our uh, new buses. And theoretically, we don't have a, uh, a need for replacing anything at that point. But then it starts climbing back up. And you'll see it in the chart up above. Hey, can, um, if I get in the bus replacements, uh, fiscal, next, not this fiscal year, but next, 15, that's a lot. Did we buy a lot of buses um, 12 years ago or 10, no, 15 well, years ago? There was a big uh, influx on the uh, uh, 2002. There was a lot of buses that were purchased with a big grant that came in. And so uh, there's quite a number of buses there. The 9800s, we still have about 18 of those that need to be replaced. So, you know, there's, there's varying degrees. But uh, we're working slowly through a lot of these. Uh, one of the big uh, pushes that we're having is that of VTA and our... Uh, Eddie has been uh, negotiating with VTA on obtaining uh, at least 10 uh, diesel hybrids, VTA. right? Mm -hmm. 2014 diesel hybrids. They've got about 90,000 miles on them. They're reducing service, so they're like uh, oversupply of buses, and they're, they're going to be transitioning them to us if the board approves, their board approves. We want to thank Eddie for being on top, of, and you for being on top of that one. It was, yes. Uh, that's great. Yes. And, uh, uh, there's uh, also uh, four articulate. Direct Director Leopold had a yes, question. Sir. Well, I just, uh, um, I couldn't understand. Um, in 2020, mm -hmm. where it talks about 15 bus replacements, you mentioned 10. If we put aside, uh, I mean, uh, it's a big number. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how. Uh, uh, how are we going to pull that off? It's a combination of, of replacements and refurbishments, uh, overhauls, extending the bus life out. So you could oh. have an older bus and refurbish the engine and the interiors and give it another six years. But to go. isn't the refurbishment the line above it where it says three? Right, but in other, in order to in order to balance things out, I mean, we're looking at fifteen there that we would like to buy, but maybe we can't afford it, so we would have to re. It, it's kind of a, 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 a document that's living, so it changes depending on what our finances are, what we're able to achieve, and how we're able to move forward with it. It's set now to go forward in this direction, but it may change in the future. Yeah, so I mean, I, I understand that we want to put aside money each year to, to uh, $3 million a year to, to, to have, and I imagine we use that to outright purchase and or leverage at whatever percentage um, uh, to get uh, grants. But when I see a number like 15, you know, that's, that's, I, I just don't know how realistic that is. So I, I think. It seems, to, it seems pretty close. Mm -hmm. right? Eddie and Aaron might chime in, but I believe the 15 and make some assumptions about the VTA transfer of equipment. Um, if that goes successfully this month with their board, we will bring that to you next month. That's the plan to accept the equipment if you so choose. Uh, I believe in that year we're also getting our uh, four Proteras uh, in that mix. And uh, we also have the five Gilligs that we've already ordered that are coming in. So am I right, Aaron? Did I hit on those? So that's why that number looks so large in, in a single year because it's a combination of a very, a very big transfer of equipment from VTA 
five gigs that we've already placed the order for, and and uh, up to four uh, arrivals of our Proterra electrics. That's that's what's, there's a whole level of detail beneath this in spreadsheets. Yeah. This is just a roll up of that. But I I, I want to make a point clear, and, and you just touched on it, Director. Um, this plan assumes that the board continues with its commitment of $3 million a year to capital. This plan does not assume anything in the way of prevailing in grant applications. So, which, which is really what's pretty awesome about this plan is that um, if you stay with your $3 million a year commitment, if we never receive another grant, we can be in balance by 2022. Now, between now and 2022, we talk about strategies to make those bars that start going up in 2024 come back down. But we got ourselves in balance by 2022. Every grant we win from here on in will help these bars move. So we, we win grants, we'll get, maybe we'll get uh, in balance in 2021. We win grants, maybe we don't start to get out of balance until 2024, 2025. So strategically, we start fixing the plan and giving ourselves some breathing room to figure out how to um, make 2024, 2025 never happen again. We bought ourselves some time because we got ahead of the curve finally. Um, but it, it, it relies, I can't underscore it enough, it relies on the board's continued commitment of $3 million for capital a year or this plan blows up. Um, and, and then just following up, um, the lease bus question, you just explain a little bit more about what that is. So you might recall, Sarah, why don't you talk about the Paul Revere's because that's a good example. So we had an opportunity uh, to purchase uh, three, we call them Paul Revere's. They're actually new flyer buses, uh, 2016 uh, vintage. Uh, they were purchased by a private concern over in, in Boston. And uh, it was put out through a broker that the buses were being offered for 475000 apiece, and they only had 2,000 miles on them. Wow. So as a result, uh, they one by land, two by sea. It's like a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> we were told, I, I explained that Daniel Zaragoza, the, the superintendent of uh, Paracruz, was the one that alerted me to this because he had contacted someone at CTA and had a relationship and they let them know, hey, this is coming down, all right? So consequently, what ends up happening is um, I went over and spoke to Alex and said, hey, um, they got these buses for sale. He says, get on a plane and go over there and check them out. I want those buses. So we di I did, and they were great. I mean, brand new. They, 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 didn't, they didn't even have dirt on them, really. Um, so consequently, we negotiated a lease to purchase agreement with, with a broker, a broker house, and we were able to uh, get the buses. Um, we're paying approximately $26,000 a month for three buses, and it'll, it'll pan out for um, six years, but it's, it's amortized, and we can pay it off earlier if we so choose without penalty. And that's how we were able to get these new, uh, newer buses. And I was just confirming with Aaron, the, the three that you see in FY19 is the Paul Revere's. So they drove them 2,000 miles? I, I had them. 2,000 miles on it? They had Why two, were they selling them? <laughs> they drive where they I mean, did they drive them around the block and say, I don't like this, and so no, let's no, no. sell them to us? I asked the same questions. Uh, basically, what happened is, this firm provides uh, services, uh, contracted services. They're, they're like, um, I guess, a, a, a discovery or, or a, a firm that will do a shuttle for the, for the airport or do a shuttle for the hospitals. That's how they were deploying them. It was explained to me that the hospital had requested 12 buses, uh, an order of 12 buses, because they were going to increase the amount of a contract by that much. And when the, the, the owner ordered the buses, he, he bought all 12 of them, the hospital decided to cut it back to eight. So he had an, uh, a surplus of, what, four, and he was able to repurpose one, and he had these three that he wasn't doing anything with, and they were just sitting there, and they sat there for two years. So um, 
they had all the warranties and such on them, and I didn't want to um, add miles to them, so I had them trucked over here so we could start the warranties uh, as, as cleanly as possible. Director Leopold, uh, and then to uh, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just trying to track the information because you mentioned that the three buses, uh, these Paul Revere buses, would be the replacement buses that we see in 2019, but that's in bus replacement, not in bus leases. Right. So I'm just oh, trying to figure out the lease bus situation, how that works. We have six in 2021, four in 2022. Right. The lease purchases, right? So that's why they're in the purchase line. Lease would be like the uh, Arctic, which we're just leasing. We don't buy, we're never buying those, or at least we don't plan to buy them at this point. Yeah, we'll go back and check that. It could be yeah. that it could be that it belonged in the lease, but we we are proposing that anything we do in the lease be the similar type of fashion where it's a lease purchase with a zero residual at the end of the lease that we would we would own it and so the bus replacements would be more uh, generally m more outright purchase <laughs> that's correct these buses would be the ones in which we would have a multi-year agreement but at yes. the end have the, that's the correct nothing and what happens with the leases and and sort of the reason why we don't want to do too much in that realm is just like with the paul revere's you take your three million down by the annual lease servicing costs. So now we have three leases, we have a little less than three million uh, next year. If we lease more, we have to pull that annual lease payment out of the three million, so we have a little bit less to invest in the coming year. So it's, it's a delicately balanced plan that assumes a combination of efforts, leases, refurbishments. Refurb the beauty of the refurb refurbishment is we spend a lot less money we buy another six, seven, eight years for that bus. We take that bus and move it out in time. It doesn't come back into the mix until a little bit later on. And then, um, uh, and then of course, purchasing. And so the purchasing plan says we'll have money to, to leverage against grants, but if we don't get a grant, like this year, we, we put a million dollars towards bus bus facilities, we didn't get the grant. So we will come back and discuss either using that million to go buy a bus or rolling it into next year to, to be more aggressive in our leveraging. So that sort of brings me to another point. Um, our intent today was to introduce you to this item and have it referred to Capital Standing Committee to get into a lot of these details. These are really good questions. And then ask the Capital Committee to report back to you. That, that's ultimately what we're looking for, if you don't mind. Is there um, a continuity with the buses? Do they all look, are they look alike? I mean, we're buying, it seems like we're kind of buying mishmash, we're like buying them all up. Are they, do they look alike or since they're different brands, do they? No, actually uh, the three Paul Revere's were uh, new flyer and mm -hmm. uh, they look similar to the 35 foot 1300s, which is 2013 vintage. Uh, they're just larger, they're 40 footers. and. They're painted yeah, the same, colors same color. Same, same graphics. I get the graphics yeah. part, but I'm just curious of the, the body. It doesn't so matter. The body's, the body's pretty much the same. Um, and then we just got had like what, we just released five, five of them not too long ago. So this is the three Paul Revere's. And, and then we have now another three coming in? No. Um, so what's we, the total lease? We're not we proposing now? to lease, by this plan, um, not proposing to lease additional buses until 2021. So we're do, we just have three lease to buys right now. That's all we're, we're right. dealing with. That's correct. Okay. And then um, just a quick question, and Aaron probably may know the answer, but when's um, our Watsonville electric bus coming? Because, <laughs> you know, I've been sitting on this board for over three years. <laughs> what, Watsonville electric bus is still not on order. It's in the four that we're continuing to work with Proterra on. Um, it is, again, this, is, this goes back to this CARB discussion we had earlier. Getting into electric buses is not just flipping a switch and saying you want to get into electric buses. This has been a very difficult thing for us to learn about. And we don't want to make a mistake. And we've had num numerous meetings, including sending Ciro and a team down to LA to meet in the room with Proterra to hash out a list, a long list of questions. We've now got all the specs sorted out, but we're down to a couple of key issues. One being weight. We're, we're buying Proterra's newest and greatest bus, 600, 620, whatever it is, which allegedly goes more than the 150 miles, underscore allegedly, because we won't believe it till we see it. But we are buying the one that has the most batteries and energy, but 
they have to answer two very important questions before we finalize that. We need to know that the axle weight will be compliant with the new state uh, regulation. They haven't been able to answer that, answer that yet. And because it is their newest, biggest bus with lots of batteries and lots of weight, we need to make sure that once we load that up, fully loaded with people sitting and standing, that we don't exceed the legal gross weight of that vehicle to operate on a street. The last thing I want to do is buy a bus and have to post on that bus that we can only carry sitting loads. That's what not, is everyone else doing now, though? I mean, I'm, I'm sure people are buying electric buses now. They're, they're all struggling with the same questions, but nobody has the newest Proterra yet. There are several orders in it in for those, and they're all sitting in the same place we are. Will their electric buses be grandfathered in with into this, you know, the new regulations? The ones that currently have electric buses? I mean, I, I have a hard time believing that they're going to create all the, you know, they're going to be like, oh, well, these electric buses, you can't, they're no longer, you know, relevant. No, the new regulation is stair-stepped. So each year you get, you get a little bit more restrictive until you get to the final year of the regulation. So we need to make sure that the Proterras delivered next year are compliant with next year's axle weight requirements. So are we waiting for this to get to that final tier before we move with any electric buses? Because nope, we're just we're, kind of we're, disheartening. May, we're waiting for Proterra to assure us that the weight of the vehicle will be compliant. They communicated with Cyril recently that they're running the calculations and they'll get back to us soon. That's really the stumbling block right now. We're just waiting on that. I think we've sorted out all of the other specifications. Is that correct? Yes. So this dream of the Watsonville bus, how that's wait, we're years now. So I, I've been waiting years and now it's going to be, is that what you're saying right now? Because I was expecting it to be done. Erin's shaking her head yes. So Probably late next year at the earliest for that bus. Mm. It'll be before the Capitola bus. <laughs> just, yes. uh, just, Director Rockton, I have two questions. One, in the narr narrative part of the report, we talk about buses uh, being beyond their useful life at 12 years. But didn't the federal regulation change from 12 to 14 years for like how long you're supposed to hold onto a bus? It's a good question. So they're speaking out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, the regulation is still 12 minimum that you have to hold it for. But we think at some point they're going to move it to 14 because even in the transit, a transit asset management plan, which we filed ours a week ago to be compliant, it's due October 1st, um, they're recommending 14 years on buses. But it's not in the reg yet. I think it will be soon. And my second question, um, I know it's, it will end up being counterintuitive to the public and you know, we'll see like, what are you guys up to? But our, our plan is not to buy only electric buses from this day forward. Our notion is we're to get to 2040 with electric buses. We're going to, you know, it's sort of one step back, two steps forward, hopefully, rather than the reverse. So we start increasing the electric per the percentage of our fleet that's electric. This chart doesn't talk about the, whether these buses we're purchasing are electric or, you know, uh, CNG or, what, or diesel hybrid or whatever the heck. Is it premature to ask, could we get a chart at some point that tells us how this chart plays out to 2040 with the electric question being played into it? So in the end, you don't end up, you know, yeah, we got, we managed to get on top of the question of replacing you uh, out of, out of uh, date buses, but we still haven't addressed the issue of how we're going to be an electric fleet by 2040. Is that a premature it, question? Or no, no, it, it's such a chart. It, it, it's in there. Have an idea about how we're going to make it happen? I, it, it's I can in there. answer that pretty Great. simply, I believe. Um, so the uh, chart is based on the useful life of the bus, right? There's, there's basically 94 buses behind that chart. So as those buses become obsolete, we're looking at the year to see whether we're going to purchase C&G, and it's 12 li years of life, right? They have to be done by 2040. Right. So as these age out, we're, we're choosing C&G uh, based on that method, and then uh, electric once we start bumping up against that. So uh, that's, that's in that plan. Uh, currently, beyond the electric buses we've been discussing, the, the four Proteras and the three over-the-road coaches, we don't have a plan to purchase electric buses in the, the next few years. So the one a problem in that plan could be, it wouldn't necessarily be, but could be that we manage to not buy any buses that are not electric going past, the, the, whose useful life will go past 2040. 
but it's possible we'd face a cliff of having to buy an awful lot of electric buses in 2039 or something. Am I wrong? Okay, let me let me just clarify. So the, the this goes this is the overlap with the CARB uh, regulation, and this assumes either 2023 or 2026 implementation on CARB. CARB doesn't mandate that in any particular year you buy electric buses. What CARB says is in a particular year, if you're buying buses, a certain percentage has to be electric buses. And so part of what we have been fighting for is for Metro to be considered a small property. And, and we should be a small property. And if we are designated a small property, then we don't have to mandatorily start buying percentages of our procurement as electrics until 2026. If we're classified as a large property, which is counterintuitive, but if we are, in 2023 we have to start, if we were procuring buses in 2023, 25% would have to be electric. We took a position, we, you, the board, and us, took a position that we'd like to push out the mandatory aspect of electrics as far as possible so that we can learn with our own buses that we're going to buy and learn from the VTAs, MTAs, and munis that are diving in with two feet um, what works and what doesn't work. So that's why we want to push it out. But this plan does assume that we're going to have to buy them. And this plan assumes that from 2029 forward, 100% of what you buy are electric. No, nothing's going to change in that. I'm sure CARB is going to stick with 2029 and forward, 100% have to be electrics. Um, but it's how we get there, those initial steps that we're wrangling over right now. Thank you. That's very helpful. If you look at FY26, that one bus in the bus replacement uh, yes. row, that would be electric. We're buying one bus. You've got no choice if, if the mandate is 2026. And, and that you, you don't have the costs behind this, but we also have the costs for these bus replacements and leases and refurbs all built And then in, those go up because back. electric buses are more expensive. Absolutely. So it's starting in 2026, yes. the, the yeah. cost per bus will go up dramatically and the overall cost will go up for whatever number of buses we buy. But under the plan that you authorized a couple of months ago, um, you're allowing me to procure compressed natural gas buses right up to the last moment that we can procure those. I, I think the board well understood why we can't afford to just only buy electric buses at this point, and given all the arguments you've made about knowing what we're doing and not wasting the public's money. But we are we do have a job to do in explaining this all to the public. They're going to want to know, if you want to be all electric, why are you buying, you know, today, why are you buying something that's not electric? Well, because we'd have to take, serv we could do that, we'd just have to take service off the road to make it happen, which is not going to be acceptable. Great. Part of the plan that we've put together here also includes the fact that we have a fueling facility that has a useful life up to 2040. So a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes with this whole plan has a lot of components to this. And so consequently, we, we kind of want to stage everything in as, as we're going along so that we don't jump into something that we're going to regret big time. Uh, for Director Dutra, I know that he wants his uh, electric bus, but yesterday, yeah. yesterday, we but all want him to have his bus. The core factor is that we did do a trip to VTA that purchased five of these buses, and I was not pleased with the with the performance of those buses or the quality of workmanship that we were able to see from those buses. And the conversations that we had with Proterra was. And I'll, I'll put it succinctly, if you send me something like that, I'm sending it right back. So they are looking at it from a much different perspective. And a lot of it is governed by the fact that we're small and we want to take care of the money that we have. I mean, we don't want to just buy something and all of a sudden end up with something we don't, it, it's not going to be useful for us. You're going to, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. We'll hold on to the dream. <laughs> yeah. You Director it. Lynn. So that, mo that money doesn't expire then, right? Is that what I'm saying, the grant money? There's no expiration. Uh, yes and yes and no. We have one. We have the LC top money that we have to work with the state to get an extension on. Um, it comes up due next year. Um, we think we will have a very good argument and good success there because the state is in control of LC top. The state is about ready to force us to buy electric buses. And you just don't go to an electric bus lot and pick up an electric bus. So um, we can also show our due diligence that this last two years has been nonstop work on this program, trying to get it to a place where we can place an order. Um, 
I'm going to be honest with you. We're nervous Nellies about this. This is happening on our watch, and we want to bring a product to this agency using public money that's the right product. I don't want to bring a piece of junk. I don't want to bring what Ciro described that he saw over the hill here. I want to bring something here that works and that we can be proud of for the next 12 to 14 years uh, and that it's not some sort of million-dollar disaster for us or in this case, $4 million. So in summary, we're from the transit district and we're here to help, but we're not so sure about everybody else. Uh, <laughs> if they're really trying to help us or just keep the keep the ball in the air, I guess, huh? Yeah. Uh, Director Lynn, and then. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I think the strategy of learning from others, especially larger you know, agencies, their jurisdictions that, you know, we'll be having a lot more experience on maintenance and, and Working out all the kinks is a good thing, um, but Trina brought up something too. Are the, as far as the mechanics portion of it and how the maintenance is that consistent from the various buses? Or uh, would our uh, would our staff be able be trained and able to work on one style bus the same? How do they differ? So we're going to have like a, a transition period. The ten VTA buses that are being uh, transferred to us are hybrid diesel electrics. So that'll begin the process of, of the training aspect with uh, a dual propulsion type of bus. The fact of the matter is that the bus from Proterra is basically the same understructure type of componentry. You've got suspension, you've got steering, you've got all of that goes on. What differs is basically the propulsion system that is specifically electric and that is batteries and inverters and a whole number of uh, other variable componentry that they will train on. So the training will be provided. It's part of the package. And uh, we're not going to uh, allow persons that don't feel comfortable with it to just get in. They're, they're going to get their training. They're going to feel good about the training and confident going forward with the repairs of these buses. So taking a few at a time and is also an opportunity to learn and not be overwhelmed with uh Correct. Everyone trying to get on board at the same time, having a chance to learn and learn from other jurisdictions as well. On and there bus. and there is a warranty period for these buses, so consequently the the, the manufacturer will have uh, responsibility for that. Dr. Hagen, did you have a question? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, it's rather interesting to listen to all this because I live with this every day. This little machine I'm sitting on is $22,000. It's supposed to go eight and a half miles an hour. It's fine. It does for a while. But this little gizmo I'm sitting here with, is in, which is the control, is incapable of handling it. Handling the mechanism, the changes, the lifts. This little box, you can't pull it out because it's attached, is by itself $1,200. This is the third one I've had in two years. And these little items that, yeah, it's fully loaded, an excellent chair, designed to fit me. Uh, all the guarantees with this chair was designed and okayed if I only weighed 150 pounds and the chair was only 120 pounds. Unfortunately, the chair is 300 pounds and I'm 200. As a result, none of this stuff is working efficiently. Instead of going 22 miles for a recharge, I'm lucky to get 12 to 13 miles. These are the same things I'm listening to every day, only on a much smaller scale. Really good example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the Take him to Congress. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say on the car technology that that has uh, gotten better. So that you know, I don't want. We, we shouldn't just uh, cast all aspersions. There are advances being made in the technology. Um, uh, you know, I drive an all-electric car, and I took it up to Tahoe this weekend. It was the first time I took it that far, and um, and, it, and it worked really well. And so... Back home. <laughs> well, it's a lot easier coming back from Tahoe because it's all downhill. <laughs> uh, but, but you feel it on the hills, and that's what, sure. that's what the, the big issues are. Does this need any approval? Wait, to move forward to... Okay, I mean, are we going to go out to the public or? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, oh, but uh, yeah. did you have uh, any other further comments, Cyril? Uh, no, not unless you have other questions. No. Good, great questions uh, that we have here. Any comments from the public? Uh, 
Just one quick comment. You know, you got to uh, pleasure your mechanics and your and how um, we need to invest in them because they're going to be you know they're spearheading on on on. on and all of this from there, because they're going to be working, you know, from diesel to the hybrids to, you know, all these components. So, you know, we do got to invest in their their expertise and just knowledge. Thank you. Great point. Yes. We have training in each of these grants. So we do have funding for quite a bit of training uh, as we go. Thank so. you. Yes. Any other question, uh, statements from the public? A, um, I move for approval. Second. Second. Okay, this is going. So we're going to move this to the capital committee. Is that correct? Is that yes. the order? And then we'll come back. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a, a motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Thank you, Cyril, for that sure. brief explanation. Brief. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> His explanation <laughs> was brief. <laughs> Okay, we'll go to number uh, item number 15 to approve adopting Title IX, Chapter 1 of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Administrative Code related to one revised policy regarding the use of fixed route services and transit facilities, including passenger code of conduct and service suspension exclusion, and two, a revised passenger code of conduct and service suspension ex exclusion policy for Paracruz. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, directors. Uh, you might recall that in January of this year, we brought you the very first code of conduct for uh, Santa Cruz Metro, and we're really proud of that. Um, and in the in the process of discussion, uh, I think it was Director Leopold asked us if we had taken this to the MAC and to the ND TAC, um, and we were embarrassed to say that we did not. And so, what you agreed upon is that you would adopt the code of conduct, uh, but you directed us to go back to the MAC and the END TAC and receive their input on the code of conduct, um, which we have done in the months since. So we've been to, uh, I think, MAC twice and also to END TAC, received their comments, incorporated uh, those comments into the code of conduct. You have a red line version. You can see where the changes were made. In addition to that, uh, staff uh, came up with some additional things that we need. This will be a little bit of a living document. It's our first. So I may come back to you next year with more revisions, um, but we want to get it right. Um, but you have a really good version now. And one of the things that we added is as a result of an inquiry from a, a, a movie company wanting to use one of our buses and one of our bus stops, we needed to add some language into this policy to address that. Um, we chose to go that route. Uh, in conferring with legal, we chose to go that route as opposed to a standalone uh, movie shoot policy. LAMTA has a standalone movie shoot policy. We're not big enough. We don't have that many requests. We figure we could just incorporate it into this and get it done. So I think it's been a good process. Uh, thank you for pointing out our error. We have now since corrected it, and we think you have a, a much better policy in front of you. We got a question from the board. I, 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 I did have uh, just Dr. a Matthews? few. Um, what does EPAM, EPAMD mean? Oh, that's it's a, I see if I, if, I, if, I, if I read it. <laughs> I don't know if it's on okay, I got it. It's, uh, it's segue, okay. yeah, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Answered my own question there. Um, I really appreciated the additions uh, on the red line resulting from consultation and further work. Um, those all made sense to me. A um, couple of questions, well, typo. I had this drilled into me at such an early age. Mm -hmm. It should be lying and not laying. People lie down, hens lay eggs. I'll give you the page number. Okay. <laughs> if you could. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> we'll, we'll go to a preschool school teacher oh, no. in very... My father. <laughs> There's a, a grammar class you, in our future. Our whole family gets grammar beat into us. Um, and then I um, <laughs> page, I think, uh, four and five, uh, on page five. Um, no, that wasn't it. Still on the red line version. Yeah, I'm on the red line version. Um, Laying down. I don't see they were questions. I, I think the one I had, now I'm not finding the page reference, was just that for the tracking of uh, reporting. Well, it's on uh, 15AB3. Um, it, it talks about repeated inc incidents of suspendable conduct will also be factored into the length of the suspension. I'm, I'm fully in support of this. Um, 
uh, action. I know from the uh, library system there is a way of tracking um, disciplinary actions across branches even. So I'm sure you'll work something out, but um, problem individuals are problems on different routes and different buses, undoubtedly. So th that's just a question, how to track that so it is meaningful. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm very supportive of this, and I think it really serves the public and the drivers. Really important. Did you say that? So it's page 12. Does it say where it is? Yeah, uh, page 12. It's under loitering, section 5-08, camping, laying down. Lying. Yeah. I'm just reading what it says. <laughs> 15BA12. Yeah. Not that it has to be answered in the policy per se, but it's something to think about. Okay. I might as well make that correction. Okay. Um, any other questions from the board? Questions from the public? Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, Mr. Leopold. Um, I have a, I'll entertain a motion. Yes. Or just did you have a question? Just quickly before, no, a comment before a motion. I will make a motion. Um, I read through this carefully because, you know, if somebody is told mm -hmm. they can't ride the bus, we're going to hear about it. And you, you don't want to go like, oh, who came up with that regulation or whatever. So I wanted to really understand what I would be visited with because it just takes one case to make right. you really feel like you've made a big, big mistake. So I read this carefully and I really think we've done a good, you know, we may change it, but it's a really good job for a start. And I feel quite comfortable that people who violate this policy shouldn't be riding on our buses or, or bothering other uh, the, the remainder of our riders. So I will move approval of the uh, new policy. Second. Second. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment as well. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, taking advantage of our advisory committee to review this and also our employees and our labor groups, you know, th those folks who have daily interaction with the public, um, it becomes really important to be able to talk to them. Uh, about the policies that we're going to enact and uh, and in some ways they play a role in enforcing. Um, I think these are, are, are good and I, y you know, we, we will learn over the years how good or <laughs> how much trouble we get in. Um, but I also appreciate, I think when this also came, uh, uh, the, having this red line version makes it a lot easier mm -hmm. to see where mm -hmm. some of the changes have yeah. been made. So. And they were good. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh, Mr. Hagan. Now this is interesting because just yesterday, Riding home from Santa Cruz, we had a, an individual for, had a very severe cough all the way. Four times the bus driver asked, ma'am, would you like to get off the bus if you're that sick? I mean, she wouldn't even bother put, putting her hand over her mouth that she was coughing. I got home and I s literally washed all the clothes I had because I was afraid God knows what's happened. I even washed down my wheelchair. Mm -hmm. There's a young girl sitting next to her. Artway got up and moved back to the back of the bus because she was scared. I mean, these are the type of situations that we need to deal with, and I think this was going to take care of situations like that. But again, our drivers were really, this driver was really into trying to protect all of us. Uh, yeah, I just wanted Matthew. to comment also. Um, some time ago, the city um, passed an ordinance limiting the amount of time people can spend in the parking garages, and there was objection to that, um, that, you know, they were public spaces, et cetera. But um, this, the discussion came down to the fact that it's not just like a park. The purpose of a parking garage is for parking. And uh, so I appreciated right in the beginning the clarification that the rules are to regulate conduct on metro facilities in connection with the metro's provision of public transportation services. That's our purpose for being, and that's why we adopt these rules. So um, that was probably a legal <laughs> suggestion. Anyway, um, it, it kind of justifies, you say, if maybe, Mike, it was you that said, if we're going to restrict people's ability to ride or, or be in the facilities, why? And, and that's the why. We have a motion. Uh, any other questions? Uh, motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's ordered unanimously. Move on to item number 16, to uh, a proposal to approve consideration of issuing a formal request for proposals for an electronic fare payment pilot project for the Highway 17 Express Service. Uh, Pete Rasmussen. 
Yes. Good morning, Chairman and Board Our members. Transportation plan. As, uh, sorry, cut you out there. Um, as part of initial fare restructuring discussions earlier this year, the board directed staff to explore options for new fare technology in order to address several limitations with the current fare collection system. Those limitations make fare payment inconvenient for customers and also create operational problems for Metro. Some of those limitations include there is no currently no single ride Highway 17 express ticket available for purchase at a Metro TVM or customer service booth, which forces a single ride customer to pay on board the bus with cash. The adult fare for Highway 17 express is seven of $7, not exactly an amount that people readily have available in their wallet. And although customer service at Santa Cruz Metro Center will provide change, Metro has no customer service presence at Scotts Valley Transit Center or San Jose Diridon Station. So the customers sometimes have to go to the store and make a purchase in order to get change. Customers who ride Metro frequently and use a period pass such as a 31-day pass or a stored value card such as cruise cash or a cruise card must go to a Metro Transit Center in order to add value to their card. A Metro rider survey showed that customers would prefer an option to reload value either online or at a retail outlet in their neighborhood. Aside from the customer inconvenience, there is operational delay. Cash payment on board the bus is time consuming. At peak travel times, staff has observed boarding times for the Highway 17 Express as long as 10 to 12 minutes, with most of that from feeding bills and coins into the fare box. Now I'll take a step back and provide some history. Metro's fare collection system was installed in 2011-2012. It included new fare boxes across the entire fixed route fleet, as well as ticket vending machines, TVMs, at transit centers and Cabrillo College and print encoding machines, PEMS, for customer service to encode passes and tickets. The fare boxes themselves are expected to last through around 2023, but the TVMs and PEMS have already experienced several failures that have required extensive maintenance and or replacement. So while we're not at the point of needing an imminent replacement yet, it's wise to begin looking down the road at replacement options. As it happens, Transit fare payment technology right now is in a period of rapid transition. Small to mid-sized transit agencies have relied for decades on fare boxes that receive cash and uh, magnetic striped disposable passes that you're familiar with for our system. More recently, there have been durable plastic cards known as smart cards, such as Metro's cruise cards or Bay Area's clipper cards. Within the last five years, and especially accelerating this year, more than 50 transit agencies across the country have introduced mobile ticketing, the ability to purchase and display a transit ticket on a smartphone. It addresses many of the problems outlined above and is also a technology that can be deployed fairly quickly and without having to completely replace existing equipment. That makes it ideal for a pilot. With mobile ticketing, a customer would download an app to their smartphone set up an account with a debit or credit card for payment, and then purchase a single ride fare or any of the any other ticket options. Then they would activate that ticket just prior to boarding the bus. From that point, there are several different ways that the mobile ticket can be verified. The simplest is visual verification. For that, an animated image or a word or phrase is displayed, something that has changed daily which the operator then verifies as being the valid daily image and words. In more advanced systems, there is a piece of hardware called a validator installed on the bus, and the customer holds their phone close enough for the validator to read it. Some vendors use a barcode similar to an airline boarding pass, while others use technologies involving radio waves. In the RFP, we do not intend to prescribe any one particular method we want the vendors to propose their recommended solution, and the evaluation panel will then select the best proposal. Regardless of the type of system and service we select, it will provide useful information regarding customers' willingness to try new payment methods. While this RFP is for a short-term pilot and limited to the Highway 17 Express, the hope is that this is only the initial step toward a larger project that would cover the entire fixed route system and may include replacing the outdated equipment that we have now. I'd like to close by saying that 
Staff believes that updated fair collection <clears throat> technology ties in well with the real-time arrivals app that is part of the ITS system that was brought to the board in June. Both projects will add customer convenience and project a modern up-to-date impression of Metro. That concludes my presentation and I'll now be happy to respond to any questions. Mr. Leopold. Um, I think this is a really good move forward. I know we've talked about it in the subcommittees. Um, I, I just think an evaluation of, of the systems, the idea of, of something that is maybe used by our neighboring uh, transit systems should be given some weight because the, the idea of someone go take, using it to go to the Highway 17 and then right, right. get to Deardon Station and be able to use it for the next thing, uh, the, there might be value in that. And I, I, and I won't pretend like I know yeah. that, how that technology works. I just thought the, the idea that, you know, one day if we, if we have a card to use the Clipper card because that Clipper card can be used then throughout the Bay Area, it just sort of connects us in with, that, uh, with that larger transit system that would be helpful, I think, to our are to our riders. One of the avenues that we're exploring is whether we can join in on the Clipper system. And additionally, uh, the newer technology is more flexible, so we believe that that will make it easier to be able to tie into other systems. Great, thank you. Mr. Rockton? I, I just wanna say I, I commuted over to San Francisco using Highway 17 once a week last year, uh, every week, almost every week. And if anything, this description of the problem of how long it takes to load people is under, an understatement. I mean, I, I know there's some of those times where at least 15 minutes. And the problem is I started carrying $40 and $1 bills with me because you stand in the line and people go, well, how do you pay for this? And they didn't, you know, they could, they go inside and the people at the desk tell them, well, we don't make change. Go to the store, they won't give you change unless you buy something. That was absolutely, at Dearden Station, that's absolutely the case. But both at Santa Cruz boarding, but even more importantly, coming back the other way, there'd be a line of people, and it's not just feeding the money into the thing, it's just not having $7 or even having 10 that you could throw $3 away with or something. And so I found myself going, I, if I want to get on this bus and get where I want to go on time, I need to bring $40 and $1 bills. And when people start to, because there's, and there's negotiations, what do you mean you don't have a way for me to pay for this ride or something? I walk up there, you know, I start paying for people so we could get the bus to leave. And that's not the way it's supposed to work, I don't think. So I, I, this is really, it's a serious issue. And this technology is everywhere. You can, get, you can use it at uh, movie theaters in downtown Santa Cruz. You can use it at museums in San Francisco. Show your smart, I don't even have a smartphone, but I watch these other people doing this. Just show your phone. I think we want to move towards not having the drivers have to say, uh, you know, I like that way that looks or something but to have it where people can put it over top of something and it goes beep like at the airport or somewhere else. Because I, I think it's asking our drivers to do a bit much because there'll be dis disagreements. People, you know, drivers say that doesn't look like the right code for the day or something. Or So I, I mean, that might be a way out, that's an easy way out of it, but it'd be better to have a little, even if it costs a little more, something that people can just put their thing on a... Like an airplane. Like when you get on the airport yeah. or something like that, could, rather than making it sort of a personal decision based on the drivers looking at it and thinking it's the right way to get on the bus or something. It's not an absolute comment about stuff, but that'd be our preference would be worth some money to have it not be put on the drivers to make the choice about whether it's a valid pass. Other comments? You know, I've, I've had um, people approach me as far as Scotts Valley because there's no one there and, and that being an issue and there's no retail there's not, not even a store nearby that's, you know, quick to get to. It's a block or so away. So I think, you know, that would be really important for all the Highway 17, particularly Highway 17 riders there. The other challenge, I just sent an email a little bit ago. Um, I've had people in Scotts Valley say they take the bus, Highway 17, and then connect and go to San Francisco, sometimes staying overnight and needing a way to be able to show their Metro customer. And I don't no a solution yet because of the no overnight parking due to the people using it for overflow that live in the area and just park vehicles there. And I'd explain, well, our intent with the no overnight is not to prohibit Metro customers, but it's because of some of the other issues that are being misused. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure as we're thinking about this, if we can think of a way to have something to, uh, for in a vehicle so that we can address that issue. Um, we're coincidentally bringing you the uh, parking ordinance next month, and we'll, we'll have some of that incorporated into it. What, what we're gonna investigate for Scotts Valley 
is the possibility of a very inexpensive uh, machine that could dispense mm -hmm. overnight parking uh, um, media that you could display on your dashboard. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's something that's what I was thinking. You know, it wasn't. I had no solution to give rather than, you know, right now we're we're not taking the action yet. We're still working out the kinks, but we we don't intend to prohibit a metro customer from being able to to travel to the Bay Area and stay the night and come back. By Absolutely, bus. we we want to fix that problem. Yeah. I mean, somebody could theoretically park at at Scotts Valley Transit Center, go over the hill, catch an Amtrak, and go away for two three weeks on vacation and choose to leave their car there, we need to figure out a way to make that okay. Perfect. Thanks. If I could interject, sure. um, basically we have a mechanism in place where uh, I've been approached with that particular situation. Sure. And the comment basically is to have them call the customer service department, uh, identify their car, give us their license number, and uh, an understanding of how long they'll, they'll be utilizing the, the park and ride facility there. And that way we're not... Um, we're not tagging them or, or calling it in as, as an abandoned vehicle or whatever, right? And we understand that they'll be there for a few nights, one night, a few nights, whatever. Okay, so that that's an option right now. Good. I, that gives me something to refer because I've been approached lately a few times, so thank you. Director Matthews? Um, I guess you'll want public comment, but uh, given all the discussion here, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I was prepared to I can make go. the motion. Yeah, I was going to ask for public comment, uh, certainly. Any, anybody from the public would like to address us on this issue? Mr. Moss, <laughs> you, you, you like that idea. <laughs> okay, we got it. We got uh, the drivers, the drivers like it, so that idea. <laughs> okay, uh, Director Dutra. I, I just, I think this, you know, the, the age we live in, convenience is everything. So I'm, I'm glad that we're moving forward with this. And I, I was actually going to make the same comment that um, Rockin made about the, the making it easy and just kind of showing it on the phone eventually mm -hmm. if we can look at some sort of technology that is that found um i think it just makes it easy for everybody and you really don't have to involve the bus driver I mean, you can just go in and do that so um so i i, I think this is something that's important i, I also I, I guess my question would be if you were to um you know, you just don't only ride the bus over the, the hill, but you're, you're getting some sort of, um, you know, money put onto your car, your, your phone, and you're using, like, local routes. Would you have to just go back river back to the old system, I would imagine? Or, I mean, is that that? Because that's where I think people might get a little bit kind of, you know, like, oh, okay, I just have to use it one way, do it one way one, when I'm going over the hill, but when mm -hmm. I'm here, i got to do it another way. I think it might become a little bit of a frustration. I think for right now it's going to be limited to the Highway 17 mm -hmm. Express. We'd have to figure out a way if they, mm -hmm. we could. How, is there a, a timeline for this pilot then? Um, we're looking to put the RFP out in October and looking at beginning of January 19. No, like how long will the pilot last oh, for? 12 months. Just a year. Okay, so then after that, then we yeah, can probably look. Right. Okay, yeah. that's fine. So Sergeant given that, I'll go ahead and um, move the recommended action with the understanding that staff takes into account the comments made by the members here. Second. Second. Uh, by, okay. Uh, we have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Adopted unanimously to uh, go out for request for proposals. Um, we are going to um, be um, going into closed session. Shana, do you have any comments on that? Sure. Uh, we're going to be going into closed session for a conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code. Section 54957.6. We do not anticipate, as far as I know, any action coming out of closed session for those in the public who might wish to stay to hear an announcement. I don't know if there's anybody from the public would like to address us on this issue before we go into closed session. Eduardo Montesino, representative of Fixed Road Bus Operators. So, um, I encourage you to look at the, our, our proposal that staff is going to present to you. But um, we also need to be um, more respect for each other. Yesterday's meeting with staff was not um, not only not productive, but accusatory and insulting, from claims of bad faith bargaining to claims that Metro should offer zero because of no property ha um, has a differential like this, um, which is incorrect because staff has information that Bakersfield Golden Empire Transit has a differential like this. So just, you know, uh, words. Thank you. Thank you. Respect needs to go both ways, though. Any, so any other any other comments from the public before we go into closed session? 
Okay, we will recess into closed session. And um, I don't think we'll be uh, coming back with anything reportable. Okay. <laughs>